الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله. So we've had some questions coming in. The email address is info at masjidumar.org.uk. Yeah. So you can continue to send emails. Iqbal by his screen, taking a screenshot. I don't know if screenshotting is a verb. So he's taking a screenshot and he's sending them on. So I will go through them, not in any specific order. So please don't be offended if uh, you send your email first and I go through in different orders. So we're just going to go through them, inshallah. And those who wish to ask questions, I think the sisters are already here. So papers will be, and possibly pens as well, will be sent to you uh, for you to write your questions. Uh, I guess we could start off with a nice positive one. Assalamu alaikum. My personal observation seems to be that senior scholars exude strength are contagiously happy, optimistic, and driven. Is this roughly accurate? SubhanAllah, you could not have hit the nail on the head, brother, whoever you are. <laughs> if so, how do, they, how do lay folk go about gaining these traits in their lives, such as prescribed supplications, actions? Or would you say this is more of a byproduct blessing of the seeker of knowledge? Well, in short, um, obviously, once you connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you trust in Him, and you leave your affairs to him, then the burden on your shoulders becomes less. Once you accept your fate, once you accept what he's given you, then what is there to be upset about? Alhamdulillah, every morning you're getting up, you have life, you have ability. So I would say, yes, I'm more inclined towards to say that it is a byproduct or a blessing of those people who have committed their lives to Allah. And as a consequence, Allah gives them that serenity and peacefulness on the earth. How do we gain that? I guess by adopting their practices, trying to imitate them as to the best of our ability. And inshallah through that, Allah SWT will give tawfiq as well. My second question is that is a HIF student considered a seeker of knowledge? Not necessarily by the absolute definition of the term. Uh, HIFS obviously is knowledge in a sense, but it's a case of memorizing. And when a person memorizes, he may not necessarily understand what it is that he's actually memorizing. So of course, what you put inside a vessel will save that vessel, will have an effect on that vessel. But will it be considered as a seeker of knowledge, uh, not in the technical definition of the term? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When someone texts, is it wajib to respond? And does it have to be in text form or is verbal enough? Obviously, when somebody gives you salam, then by saying it, if you're not going to reply to the person, then saying wa alaikum salam is sufficient. But if you're going to reply back to the person, then it's etiquette that it is included in the message. Obviously, we do a lot of AA and, uh, in, in things in ASA and AWFW and all these acronyms, which I never understand. So whenever someone says to me, AA, I reply back, RAC. <laughs> so I don't know whether he's talking about a uh, breakdown cover or he's actually giving me salam. So it doesn't hurt too much to say, Assalamu Alaikum. So we can say that. Uh, I know we're on to SMHs and well, all these, all these L, I know LOL is like old school, but you know, all these little acronyms that people like to do. And, and you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit old fashioned. Um, if you want to write something, then write properly, man. Learn English. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Which would be more rewarding, going for Hajj or Umrah or helping the starving Muslims saving lives? Well, I guess if Hajj is for, then Hajj has to be uh, performed. If uh, a person is, uh, remember, we, we have this habit of kind of grading uh, acts and sort of having the or situation. I won't mention the brother's name uh, because he sat here. So when the menu was put to us, do we want donna meat or pizza or Turkish? And the brother said, what are you on about? Why can't we have donna meat and pizza and Turkish? SubhanAllah. Mud of knowledge. So therefore, why do we have to sort of say, shall I do this or this? Yeah. Shall I, you know, let's do both. Let's strive to do both. So, I, you know, I'm not going to start giving a, a pecking order. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives uh, order to impacts so of those which are fard are fard, those which are wajib are wajib, and those which are sunnah muakada, sunnah muakada. Military action. Assalamu alaikum. Is it fard upon Muslim countries to take military action against Israel? So, interesting question. I think this shows our lack of uh, political awareness. Uh, about how the world works. We're pretty much so now an ummah in symbolism. 
and not in reality anymore. We haven't been an ummah in reality for a long time. You see, for example, there are Muslims in India, Muslims in Pakistan, and there's been wars against between India and Pakistan. Bangladesh was called East Pakistan until it saw independence from Pakistan. So there have been wars against Bangladesh and Pakistan. When the Rohingya Muslims wanted to leave Burma and they wanted to go towards Bangladesh, Bangladesh were one of the first countries that put up their borders and said, look, we're not going to take all of you in. Similarly, right now, just a few weeks ago, Afghanistan and Pakistan were exchanging bombs. So that's the reality on the face of it. And sometimes we get caught up in this kind of romanticism of how we can solve all the world's problems because we are this huge group of people. We may be this huge group of people, <coughs> but the Prophet Islam described us as the form on the sea, worthless. So let's at least accept those terms. Right now, those countries which are bordering Israel have peace agreements. Egypt has a peace agreement, which it has agreed in order to get some land back. <coughs> Jordan, Lebanon, most of these countries are not Islamic countries. In fact, there's only three countries, if memory serves me properly, that has the word Islamic in their name. Islamic Republic of Pakistan, obviously Afghanistan, and Iran. Islam does not necessarily practice all the laws of the Sharia. Afghanistan is trying. And Iran at the moment is the only one that's in a military capacity through proxies, possibly, engaging. So let's, you know, let's be real. And then what's little Mufti Amjid sat here in London going to tell the Egyptian president as to what he should be doing with his armies? What's little Mufti Amjid going to do here in, in London to tell the Lebanese what they're going to do with their armies? So we don't have a political structure. There is no Ummah political structure. It does not exist. So whereas you have something like the NATO, which is a confederate of countries, that come to get together to defend, most likely as a, as a rebuttal to Russia, Muslim countries don't have that. So therefore, these things can happen. So we are more favorable towards nation states. We are more favorable to protect our own rather than do things of this nature. So in short to that answer, who am I to declare whether it is followed upon Muslim countries to take military action. Each has their own legal structures now, each has their own political structures, and therefore they will decide their own. Eventually, inshallah, when there is a khalif who then resides over in whatever manner that suits over all countries and all countries accept that, those terms, then I guess it's for him, because he has legal capacity, he has the political capacity to make those kind of decisions. You know, so these can be very nice rhetoric. I can make a nice rhetorical statement to you. I can shake my fist and foam at the mouth and tell you that you all should pick up arms and do this, that, and the other, whatever. But we have to be realistic. We have to take and understand the way things are. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mufsad, if and when a sadaqatul fitr is given on behalf of a loved one who is alive, is it necessary to inform them or is that subject to if they're baligh or not? Or is that subject to if they're baligh or not? Of course, when you are conducting something on behalf of something which is an act of worship, then they have to make near, there has to be some intention behind it. So yes, one should inform them irrespective of their age. It's, so, it's amazing, isn't it? Um, our deen, mashallah, we go from the uh, miraculous, the global political to the mundane. What is the ruling on buying selling cats? So now that we've solved <laughs> the Israeli problem, now we're going to sort the cat problem out. So we, said, no, we just, what I'm saying is, look, Ajib, our, our, alhamdulillah, that our deen you know, caters for so many different things on so many different levels. Um, it, there's permissibility according to some, there's karaha, uh, but there is permissibility if they're domesticated. Do you have to pay off all debts before going to Umrah? Um, that depends on the people who you owe your debts to. If they are more than happy to delay the payment of those debts, then they, they can do so. Does mortgage have to be accounted for when calculating zakat? It doesn't necessarily need to be accounted for, but if a person wishes to deduct it, 
from their assets, then they may deduct a year's worth, just the capital, not the interest, uh, from their assets. According to some schools, debts are not deducted. So that's that batch done. I understand that home and building insurance is impermissible. Is there any alternative to home insurance that you're aware of? I've been trying to find a careful alternative, but nothing in the UK for a residential property. Wa alaikum salam. Um, you're, you're quite right. Uh, the standard sort of high street, even though not many of them are on the high street anymore, all are online, all the high, the high street is kind of defunct, isn't it? It's no longer in existence. Uh, they all use uh, usurious methods. You know, you pay £100 a month, for example. Over a year, you've paid £1,200. You have a, a bust mains in the bathroom. Your ceiling collapses, and the insurance company pays out twelve grand. So you pay twelve hundred, and you got twelve grand in return. That is riba. That is riba. You made a twelve hundred pound payment, and the insurance company is giving you twelve grand. It's just an exchange money for money, and that is why insurance is impermissible for that very reason. You get back what you give, then there's obviously some permissibility. But you get more back than what you've given, then obviously that's the problem. There are lots of companies and organizations that are trying, you know, may Allah bless them, they are trying their best to now come up with financial alternatives, whether it's investments, uh, I'm not going to name companies or name names, um, that are trying their very best in order to make that change. We should support, as a Muslim community, we should support them. Sometimes you get a lot of brothers who make that jump, who make that leap and try their very best to make a change in the community that doesn't come on board. I know there was one organization that tried to start an alternative to car insurance. It lasted for a while uh, and that's it. You know, I know there's been a lot of boycotting going on uh, against like, for example, say the Coca-Cola brand. And people have tried to come forward with alternatives. But we know that in a month's time, two months time, whoever is boycotting will be back to drinking Coca-Cola. Um, so those brothers who actually went out on a limb and invested and tried to come up with a soft drink company, they're going to be left high and dry because everyone's going to jump back off after a while. So it's just, this, these are the sorts of things that we don't do as a community. We don't support each other to grow. Uh, this is what we should be doing is supporting each other to grow and develop. So I, I, I only make comments on organizations that I act as a, a Sharia sort of advisor, consultant, expert, whatever you want to call it, because then I know the inner workings of that organization. I cannot speak for organizations that I'm looking at from afar, and I've just looked at their documents or their brochure or paraphernalia, uh, so therefore I, I can't comment. The best way would be is to see who is on that panel, uh, reliable, trustworthy ulama, and, and, and engage, engage with them. Salams, I have a condition called irritable bowel syndrome or IBS and when it's really bad I constantly release gas every couple of, uh, every couple two to three minutes. Do I need to do wudu every time I pass gas or is there a way around it? There is, uh, this would come under the hukum of ma'dhur or ma'dhura and when someone comes under the hukum of ma'dhur and ma'dhura then that particular naqidhul um, wudu, that cause of breaking the wudu is to a certain extent suspended. What we mean by that is that even if that is taking place, that person's wudu is considered still intact. However, if something else happens, he busts his nose, he falls down, cuts his knee, then obviously his wudu will break, but that won't be a cause uh, for uh, his wudu breaking. I know there's another question that I'll share as well, but this is a point that's related to it, that the Sharia only applies upon a person to the best of their ability. Now, if they're physically, like for example, we know that we have to wash four body parts, or wash three and wipe one body part. But if somebody's got ampu you know, limbs amputated, how can he wash his arms? So what happens there? Obviously, the hukum of washing arms is removed from him. So therefore, one can only act in a capacity that they have cap uh, the ability to do. So what one would do is consult uh, ulama and then take it from there. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum salam. Sheikh, what is the ruling on decorating our houses a little for Ramadan and Eid, etc.? It usually includes banners, posters, some balloons, and the like. Um, I would say in present day and age, especially with sort of like, you know, the Christmas thing and New Year's Day and everything, I don't think there's any harm, especially for children. Uh, I know we use children as an excuse all the time, don't we? You know, we say at the beginning of Ramadan, I'm not going to eat any savouries. 
And then day one in Ramadan, we say, look for the kids, man. You know, it's not right, is it? You know, we can make these decisions because we've got taqwa. But the kids are kids at the end of the day. And then obviously when the food comes and the poor kid doesn't even get a chance to smell the samosa and it's already <laughs> all a downside in the stomach. And then we have to say, look, show respect to your elders. Uh, so, you know, there is, an, uh, there is, I would say, you know, without trying to be too controversial, that, you know, there's no, there's no harm in doing so as long as it's kept within means. Uh, if you can recycle last year's, Obviously, there's, you know, you don't have to use Ramadan is Ramadan, isn't it? Eid is Eid, as long as you don't have 2023 or whatever written on it. I guess you can recycle the same things again, so it's cost effective and uh, we save the planet as well. So I would say there's no harm in it, especially if you've got children. It reminds them of Ramadan, uh, it focuses them, and it gives them some element of happiness. Uh, we don't necessarily celebrate Ramadan, so that's why I'm a little bit uh, sort of, uh, you know, it's, we have to be careful that we don't commercialize Ramadan uh, because there's going to be an element of that. People just want to make money out of it. Uh, Ramadan is a, a, a time of, sort of austerity, it's a time of reflection, it's a time of pondering, not necessarily a time of celebration. Eid obviously is a time of celebration, so I can understand for Eid, uh, one, can, one can do something of that nature. I would like to ask the following question, if a child is conceived and born out of marriage with a non-Muslim, should the child be accepted as a sibling and what are the inheritance laws? Obviously all these questions that I'm answering is based from an Islamic perspective. I think it's always good to put these little disclaimers because you know what's going to happen, a few of these questions, there's going to be a little uh, memo, a little uh, short made out of it and it'll be widespread, you know, scholar declares jihad on British Muslims or something like that and then that's it, that's, I'm, I'm done for her. So let me just say now, maybe I should have said this at the beginning, is that obviously these are queries Muslims are asking regarding their own faith and they want a faith perspective answer on that, hence the reason why we are giving these answers. So if a person, obviously, according to Islam, inheritance, there's a legal system. And inheritance is only permitted for those who are legally considered those person's children. And that means it has to be bil nikah. There has to be a nikah between the person and the, wife, the man and his wife or the woman and the, her husband in order for those children to be considered as children who can now inherit. So the way the Sharia looks at this is that the only, the only thing that can, because remember, without nikah, Without sounding too crude, obviously there's young people in the audience. Without nikah, there's no guarantee that that person is the father of that child. Uh, not necessarily saying that obviously women will behave in a, uh, in a certain way if they're not married, but the, the implication is obviously there that a, a woman who preserves herself and does not allow access to any man until she marries him uh, clearly shows the fitrat and nature of that person. And therefore, one cannot absolutely, one can absolutely be sure that the woman is this child's mother so the child can inherit from the mother, uh, but the child will not inherit from the father. However, the father still has responsibilities uh, to the child in order to maintain and provide. I would like to ask the following question. What should you do if you have feelings of being bisexual? So when it comes to any type of sexual interest, the Sharia is quite strict. I've already answered in the question previous that um, the only permissibility, yeah, just, the, yeah, I get easily distracted. You know, at school, I used to get so easily distracted. The teacher said, I'm Jad, concentrate over here. And I'd be looking out the window. So as soon as someone talks, I just get, you know, I get zoned out. So, uh, thank you. Uh, so, when it comes to, what was the question? <laughs> Bisexuality. When it comes to bisexuality, any type of interest in a sexual way has to be via nikah. Whether it's self-inflicted sexual satisfaction, whether it's with uh, a woman that you're not married to, uh, whether it's with a man, whether it's any of these things, the Sharia only permits that the man and the woman are married. So, you know, before people sort of say, oh, you know, homophobic and all the rest of it, the Sharia does not permit a man and a woman to engage in that way unless there is nikah. That is the only thing which the Sharia has permitted. So therefore, the Sharia still will consider all of these other behaviors as sinful. And it is for people who follow, follow a moral code to be told what is sinful. The government might tell us what is legal. It is legal for somebody over the age of 18 years old to drink alcohol. We would still say it is sinful. Even though it's legal, we would say it is sinful. 
it is legal to eat pork at any age in this country. We cannot say that, you know, the government hasn't said that eating pork is illegal. However, we will say it is sinful. So in the same way as we would say eating pork is sinful, in the same way as we would say drinking alcohol is sinful, as in the same way we would say have, uh, having an adulterous relationship is sinful, we would also say that any relationship of a physical, sexual nature without nikah is sinful. The Muslims or those who follow any religion for that matter, who follow a moral code, do not need to be dictated to by secular laws. Okay, that's our moral code. That has been our moral code for 1400 years. And that's our moral code that we choose to follow, not under any duress or compulsion. That's our own freedom of choice. That's our own freedom of deciding to do that particular act. Now, what we tend to get then is this conflation, or, you know, they don't fit in with British society and this and that and the other and all the rest of it, just to cause a, a ruckus, just to cause a, an issue. These matters for our moral behavior is our responsibility. If it does not impact or affect on anybody else, then why should it be of concern to anybody else? That does not mean in any way, shape or form that we are judgmental against people. Before people say, oh, you know, homophobia, or this, that, and the other, whatever, well, Muslims don't necessarily feel that a non-Muslim is gonna be successful in the hereafter. But does that impact in the way we engage with that person? Or does that impact in the, the way we fulfill their rights or their responsibilities? So there's a lot of conflation, there's a lot of confusion, and it's intentional. In order to kind of make out that, you know, this is an issue, the, you know, backward or this or that, and all these kind of derogatory terms made to do that. So I hope I answered that to the best of my ability and it was clear. Iqbalba is not stopping, man. You're gonna have to buy me some more. You're gonna have to buy me some more space on iCloud. I think that's done. I do check the Iqbal by that if I miss something, then I think I've done all of those. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, can you please clarify the following query? Question one: Whilst being a multi-day traveller from one town, city, country to another. Can one combine salahs if they feel they will most likely miss the next salah time due to either lack of wudu, wudu facility, time on the plane, train, etc.? Or is it better to perform qada if uh, salah time was missed, lapsed due to lack of wudu, appropriate place to pray? I know many people who combine salahs state that if Allah has made it easy for a traveler, uh, then why miss the salah intentionally? Um, I'm not sure if Allah has made it easy for the traveler. I'm sure if this is based on hadith. So it is the Prophet والسلام, that's made life easy. In a session a couple of days back, I explained how each legal school is formed. So when we accept a particular legal school that we're born in, whether it's Hanafi, Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, then we follow the legal school. We don't understand the legal theory, we don't understand the legal philosophy, we don't understand any of that. Because we don't understand it, because that's not our expertise, that's not what we're, what we're trained to become. We've trained to become a dentist, or we've trained to become a teacher, or we've trained to become a whatever, that's been our profession. So it's the fuqaha, the ulama, that have trained to become these experts in, 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 in law. So it's them are the ones who will then share that with us. So therefore, to then start to say, okay, you know, there's this narration, you know, what do we know? What's the, what is the uh, power of that narration? What's the quality of that narration? Is it khabul wahid? And I explained this just a few days ago, in fact, maybe a couple of days, maybe this morning. And a khabr al-wahid cannot qualify a verse of the Qur'an. A verse of the Qur'an is mutawatir. And you see, mashallah, when you come in on the little timetable there, the ayat is quoted, that salah is at a fixed time. Salah is at a fixed time. Okay, can we pray asr now? No, why not? Because as the time hasn't come in, why can't we pray Asr now? Because there's a verse of Quran which tells us we can't pray Asr now. Is there a narration which supports the co joining, uh, combining of prayers? Yes, there is. But what is the manner in which the combination is taking place? The Ahnaf will say that all this is, is delaying the Dhuhr till the end time and bring the Asr until its beginning time. And that's how you're praying them together. You're still praying Zuhr in its time. You're still praying Asr in its time, but it's on the borders of both. 
or you're delaying Maghrib until it's end time and you're bringing Isha until it's beginning time and again they're on his both on the borders so that's our school's position so that's what we adopt can women lead obligatory Eid Taraweeh prayers uh, there's been no uh, f uh, school position on that. There's only is on. S there is some discussion on a uh, jama. So oh, there's impermissibility apart from some conversation on uh, jama of uh, nawafil, and even that is considered as makru tahrimi. Is the salah valid? Yes, but it is with karaha. And we had this conversation. Uh, um, the chap that I had an interview with a few days back. And uh, about when it's a ritual act of worship, we don't look at the social impact of a ritual act of worship. A ritual act of worship, we value in terms of its reward. That what is more rewarding? Not what is it that I feel like doing, but what is more rewarding? So when we're told that if you pray in this manner, it is more rewarding for you, even though it doesn't really fit well with our kind of mindset or our soul, then that is what is more rewarding for us. It's a ritual act. So therefore, this is the distinction that we need to, we need to draw from there. That's assuming that women only praying. That's correct. Sorry, yeah, good clarification. That's assuming obviously only women are praying in that jama'at. 100%. Again, it's, it's makru tahrimi, close to haram. Even in that circumstances, with women only. Uh, crowdfunding for deceased parents. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi. People are now cl uh, crowdfunding for their parents, Sadaqa Jariya, asking for contributions from family, friends, and the wider community. Example, they are collecting 5,000 for a masjid that has a qarda hasana of 700,000, or digging a well for 1,750 in an Indian subcontinent. Please, can you shed some light on this? What does the shiri say about this? There's nothing, you know, there's nothing wrong in encouraging people to help you in uh, setting up projects which you make as a sadaqa jari and there's nothing wrong in it coming together so there's, there's you know for Bihar, there's nothing there's nothing to be concerned about how can one change his destiny qadr takdeer a couple are trying for a baby but are unfortunately having no luck any guidance or supplication dua which are recommended uh, dua obviously makes a difference. We supplicate, make dua, we ask Allah for those things. But we also need to understand that this is something which is predestination and there's an element of accepting one's predestination as well. There's nothing wrong in asking dua, there's nothing wrong in striving for change, but there's also in accepting that as well. And I think sometimes because we have life exactly the way we want it, then you know, we, we just want to perfect it. No, there's so many orphans that have no parents. I, I, I work in a very small extent anyway with a number of people who try to get support for uh, uh, to adopt um, children. Especially now with you know, the, the Muslims emigrating across here, uh, they're looking for adoption. You know, young children that are called Muslim children and there's no people to adopt. So they're now being placed with non-Muslim parents. So maybe that's the hikmah. That for some people, Allah SWT does not give children and then he brings the other children from another country here that need that. You know, Allah alam. So it's not just that, but again, it's that kind of, you know, my child. So in a way, it's a kind of an extension of us, isn't it? It becomes a possession. Remember we said that, you know, the hubbu uh, shahwat fin nisa wal banin. So, you know, this becomes like, you know, my children, my sons, ownership. In reality, you know, how long is your son your son? How long is your daughter your daughter? You know, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, he's going his own way. And then you try saying something to him, he'll, you know, he'll tell you what for. So at the end of the day, that's it. And the girl gets married, she's now with a husband. So it's a, it's a bit of a myth, isn't it? You know, my children, I'm going to hold on to these for the rest of my life. They go, you know, you reach a point in your life, a bit like where I am right now. And you kind of feel like, uh, you know, you're a spare tool. Yeah, because there was a time when you, are, you, know, you needed the children to carry them to the doctors, take them to school, bring them back home, teach them Quran, teach them this, and they're growing up and they're growing up. Now they don't need you. They've got their own jobs, they've got their own car, you know, they're running their own life. And you sort of kind of think, oh, look, it's, every, it's, it's all gone, it's all changed. So, you know, it's really about focusing what khair you can do. Whether that is through children, whether it's through your own children, whether it's through the children of the ummah that have, unfortunately, their parents have died or been killed, 
and they now have no parents and they're coming here uh, as refugees and they need families, loving families, caring families to look after them, you know, that is itself a fardi uh, kifaya because they need upbringing. They, they need parents. So, that, you know, so yes, one can make dua to change their takdeer, absolutely. Uh, but also, in a way, one can also, you know, embrace and, and uh, accept their takdeer and look at alternative ways of fulfilling their need, but also at the same time, fulfilling the children's needs. Asalaamu As Alaikum, if one washes a paintbrush with their hands and the paintbrush is made from pig, so there is a transfer of impurity, how many times do they have to wash their hands in the Hanafi Madhab to make it pure again? Do they also need to wash it with earth like the Shafi Madhab? So the pig brush bristles are not going to transfer onto a person's hand. Uh, so I think, you know, we have to just be a little bit careful that we don't, uh, obviously we don't know the circumstances of the person. Uh, many people, when it comes to Najasat, do sometimes suffer uh, from OCD as well. So therefore, they can become a little bit, you know, waham comes in and careful. The only way that you can resolve that is through some counselling, uh, where you start to unpack what is causing the OCD and you find alternative ways to manage it. I don't think there's a way of completely uh, finishing it, but at least there's a way of managing it. Assalamu alaikum. My question is in business account, when we get interest, what do we do? Can we give it to non-Muslim employees? Uh, one can't benefit from interest. So if you were to give it to your non-Muslim employees, then you're benefiting from it because they're working for you. And if 10% of their wage is interest, then 10% of what they do for you is, is coming from interest sources. So interest has to be given away with no benefit, no worldly benefit. You cannot take benefit at all from it, rather than having some benefit from it. Oh, so we're getting a couple of uh, moon sighting questions, mashallah. I ignored one earlier as well. What is it with moon sighting, mashallah? Asalaamu Alaikum, question on sighting the Hilal and the division in celebrating Eid. So we'll come to moon sighting. Now that Kari Sab's here, mashallah, we're all good. It's his favorite topic. Aslan, I have two questions that have been bothering me for a while. Inshallah, you can help guide me. What is the correct reason for not going participating in birthdays? I'm worried I will offend family members. When it comes to birthdays, obviously there's nothing within our legacy or tradition to do with birthdays. It's not something that we would celebrate. It's something that, you know, we, you see, the Muslims weren't really a, a celebratory type of people, okay? We just worked. We just strived for the hereafter. We didn't partay all the time. But now, obviously, there's more partaying coming in to our kind of way of life as well, because we want to enjoy life. Yeah? We can't wait 60 years and enjoy life in the hereafter. You know, who's going to wait 60 years, 70 years, and then enjoy life? You know, when we discuss about, alhamdulillah, our table spread, our dastakhan, and Allah blesses us with a beautiful dastakhan every evening. May Allah bless the brothers who provide it. I mean, and then we see, you know, the Prophet Alaihi just having like rutub wet dates or dry dates and water or just some milk or some a flower or whatever, you know, very difficult constraint circumstances. So that's one thing that needs to be understood. So, uh, you know, secondly, as we, you know, we have celebrations, right? And as we move on with life, uh, one thing is not to celebrate is, is, is the lack of, you know, the, the, the closer we're getting to death. That's something that we should be a little bit careful about. Having said all of that, if somebody reflects and thinks, oh, alhamdulillah, you know, that's another year done, recognizes it. Sometimes, you know, we're a bit tight, aren't we, with giving gifts and things like that. So if that serves as a reminder for someone to share love amongst family members, but doesn't try to aim it for that day and shares, then I would say there's some element of, you know, okayness to it. I'm not saying that, let's all go and start buying birthday gifts and things like that. What I'm saying is, obviously, what we don't want to do is start putting constraints in areas where there's some element of openness. So if this is out of love, if one is sharing gifts out of love with family members, then this is wrong. When we're talking about birthday parties, then that's a little different ball game altogether. You go there, there's gonna be music, there's gonna be, you know, this, that, you know, it's, it's gonna get a bit wacky, there's gonna be mixed, 
you know, you know, we, our wedding is a mix now, mashallah. So, you know, a birthday party is blatantly going to be mixed. So, you know, we've lost the boundaries of what is permitted and impermissible. So at home, you know, you want to recognize the achievement of your five-year-old, well done, son. You made it another year. You know, there you go. I'm happy for you. Just another 60 of these to go, and you'll be all right. You know, just take each year as it comes, son. Sometimes life will get difficult, and your son's looking at you because he's only five years old, like, why is dad giving me this deep conversation? Why doesn't he just give me something nice? So, you know, there is that, and obviously children then sometimes feel a little bit, you know, that they're not getting anything, they feel that like their parents don't love them. So there's got to be a lot of encouragement, there's got to be a lot of conversation, there's got to be a lot of talking. I was recently told that when praying in Jama'at, we should not be reciting as we should directly be following the Imam. I wanted to ask, how does this work for Dhuhr and Asr? Do we still not recite even though the Imam is silent? And a short follow-up, is it okay to be verbal in uh, Sajda and Tashahud? The Hanafi position is such that the Qira'ah of the Imam is the Qira'ah of the Muqtadi. That's the Hanafi position. So I'll give you the Hanafi position. Uh, other Madai will say, you know, La Salata illa bi Fatihatul Kitab, that you have to pray Surah Al Fatiha. If you don't pray Surah Al Fatiha, then your Salah is invalid. So that's the other schools. Obviously, I'm assuming this person from that question is of a Hanafi school. So therefore, the Hanafi position is that when the Imam is reciting, you are just listening. Now the question arises, yes, but you can't hear him, so how are you listening? Uh, so that has been a point of contention even amongst the uh, Hanafi fuqaha, where they've debated that, that what about silent prayer? However, I'm just going to give you the muftabihi. The muftabihi is that we remain silent. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What is the ruling on the 15 degrees and the 18 degrees for prayer and are both following its own ways? So... Uh, another question is, what is the ruling on the difference of fasting days? I say, let's get them both in. I was wondering, you know, double punch. So Isha and Fajr and also um, the uh, Eid times. So we'll come back to that. Uh, we can talk about maybe the Salah times. So the way it is understood is that astronomical twilight, uh, Shafiq Abiyad, is, correlates to 18 degrees. Okay, that's the position that's adopted. Remember back in the day, people used to go out and look at the horizon. We don't go out to look at the horizon. We've now replaced the visual uh, phenomenon with an astronomical phenomenon. So all our timetables are based on data which comes from HMNAO or whichever other web surf or whatever it comes from, which is based on predictions um, algorithms that predict when the sun's going to set. So we don't know the sun's going to set at whatever the time is on that time. Uh, we're just predicting it. Similarly, we would have timetables in every masjid 40 years from now. They're going to tell you what time the sun is going to set. 100 years from now, they'll tell you when the sun is going to set. So it's prediction, it's uh, algorithms. Very accurate algorithms, minute. So we know, and it's, a, it's valid from a fiqh basis to use these methods in order to determine prayer times. So when we're determining it, obviously Imam Saab's view, Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmanullah's view is the disappearance of the Abyad, which we correlate to 18 degrees, and the Sahibain and also the other Madhaib is 15 degrees, which we correlate, uh, which is not 50 degrees, uh, is Ahmad, which we correlate to 15 degrees. So what we find is that if you have the Wifaqul Ulama up, Wifaqul Ulama Zinnabad. Come on, man. Uh, which has all this information in there. So rather than getting too bogged down with technicalities, download the app. Uh, the information is there. Uh, if you go onto the little sort of settings cog, click on there, there'll be a little bit of an explanation of Isha time, Fajr time, full details there. And if you go to their website, there'll be even more details there, inshallah. We'll get to Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. What is the ruling on the difference of fasting days for the sighting of Ramadan as well as for Eid al-Adha? Ah, sorry, yeah, good point. On the Fajr time, and see, that's the reason why Kali Sab is here, we only adopt the 18 degrees because of the astronomical side. Remember the, the sun on both sides. One is the setting of the sun, which is what I focused on, but I didn't talk about the uh, Subha Sadiq, when the sun, when the dawn, true dawn takes place. That position is based on 18 degrees, and that's where we get that figure from. Good point. Good thing someone's paying attention. Um, I think, I think that's that batch done. Is that that batch done? Yeah, I think that's that batch done. Five, four, there. 
Assalamu alaikum. A female relative has married a Sikh man. What is the correct approach to keeping ties with her? Um, for, my, for example, we have Eid in a couple of days and it's my family's turn to host all our relatives. Should I invite her and her partner for Eid? I'm concerned it will not send the right message to our younger nieces and nephews if they see their auntie married to a non-Muslim and everyone still maintaining normal family relations with her. On the other hand, we don't want to completely alienate her in the fear that she completely goes astray. Uh, from that description, obviously, it seems that, again, it's a mixed Eid gathering, so there's issues there straight away, you know. Uh, I know it's difficult to keep sort of family away when it's an Eid, but, you know, we should try to minimize. Obviously, women are all, mashallah, dressed up. Okay, so, you know, brother-in-laws and sister-in-laws are walking past each other. Women will put, you know, some heavy perfume on. Even the brothers will have some heavy perfume on. And there's all this mixing going on and it's a jovial time anyway, so people are cracking jokes. You know, you don't know what kind of relationship that man is having with his wife. He might have had a bit of a ding-dong. He's having a chat in the kitchen. His sister is hearing him out. Anything can happen. You have to be very, very careful. I know we've become a little bit blasé and a little bit, come on, stick with the times, brothers. But it's, it's a danger, okay? Zina takes place. I don't know if we're gonna get any questions on Zina, but I get numerous questions where Zina is taking place in our homes, in our society. So let's not be you know, blind about it. Let's not be naive about it, that it won't happen to us, we're professional. You know, how do we have office affairs? It's the professional people who do them in the office, not the cleaner or something who comes in at night. Uh, so it's, you remember the, the IQ, SQ and the EQ, you can have an IQ up to, you know, the roof. But if you're spiritually corrupt, it doesn't matter about your IQ. Okay? And if you're looking Hollywood, that Weinstein fella, and all these people suddenly coming out of abusing their positions and having affairs with women, they're their so-called elite. They've got everything. They can pay for that. They don't even need to take it. They can pay for that. They can, you know, go on an island. What was his name? Epstein, whatever his name was. Right? These are the so-called elite. They're doing it. Human nature is human nature. You can't switch off human nature. So we have to be very careful. So irrespective of inviting mixed couples together, you know, husbands and wives or whatever, you know, I guess the only time is when a parent calls his kids, you know, when you get together at your parents' house. Um, you know, if all, all your kids live separately and then your mum and dad, for Eid, everyone goes to mum and dad's. Uh, but then even then, you know, women should be in one room, men should be in another room. Um, you know, it's something that we have to, you know, drop our guard on. Uh, and we have to be a little bit careful about that. So that, that issue would not come up then because the Sikh chap would be sat with the blokes. And the sister, the woman, would be sat with the, with the women. So that issue won't come up. Um, we shouldn't necessarily ostracize, uh, you know, people who, who, who adopt certain things because, as you said there, um, you don't want to completely detach. So that's something to be concerned about. However, there are, no doubt, effects on children. So if you can somehow, you know, form a barrier between the children and, and, and the, the parent, you know, the elder adults, then that would be more appropriate. So don't detach them from all the adults and all the rest of it, but the children is going to, because they will, because the, you know, young girl growing up is going to think, ah, well, you know, auntie's uh, married to so-and-so, and, -so, and I, you know, why can't I marry whoever I want? You know, why do I, and, and this is the, one of the hardest things that people find is, alhamdulillah, they can keep their house running really well. You know, wife, mashallah, baparda, she's reciting Quran, she's religious, salah, ghaira. He gets his children on that, mashallah. He sends them to a maktab, sends them to a madrasa, there on that. But then they meet their cousins when they start getting up to seven, eight, nine years old. And their cousins say, your dad's really strict. We can do this, we can do that, we can do this. And, you know, the kids come home and they think, yeah, maybe dad is a bit strict. And you start losing your children, not because of the society that they're looking at, but they're looking at their own cousins at the end of the day. They're looking at their own cousin brothers and you know, the girls are looking at their own cousin. Oh, you know, dad doesn't even let us go out, but you know, Chachu lets uh, the girls go here or Mamu lets the, his girls go there and they're staying out at a friend's house. They're staying over at Rebecca's and you know, uh, Mamu's letting them go and uh, dad doesn't even let us, you know, as soon as it gets to Maghrib time, he wants us at home. And then his authority is undermined. So it is difficult, but for children, I would say there has to be an element of Yani going into khalwa, 
where you kind of detach a little bit to safeguard their iman. You as an adult can continue to engage, and so you should as an adult, because hopefully as an adult, especially if your iman and deen is in the right place, you're not going to be impacted as much. But children are easily influenced. Children are easy, they're, they're going through their um, sort of years of formating, form, you know, getting, understanding who they are. Uh, and it happens too, too often, unfortunately. I think that's all the screenshots done now, Iqbal, but I just double check that I've answered all of them. Assalamu alaikum. What is your view on Sufism? What advice do you give someone considering thinking the Sufi uh, path with a sheikh? Um, we have within our tradition what is called Tazkiyatun Nafs. That exists within our tradition, has existed within our tradition since the time of the Prophet That's why you saw the nature of the Prophet the nature of Sayyidina Abu Bakr the nature of Sayyidina Umar and also the nature of Sayyidina Usman and Sayyidina Ali. And then we started to see sort of kingdoms coming in. If you saw the dress of these companions, you would not think that they were Amir al-Mu'mineen. You would not think that they were Khalifa uh, Rasulullah. You would not. When the delegations used to come and they used to see Sayyidina Abu Bakr you know, sleeping in the masjid or Sayyidina Umar reclining against a wall and they would say that this is you know, our Amir al they said, this is your king. <laughs> he is the one that the Persians are frightened of. He is the one the Romans are frightened of. Him, that man, that old man leaning with his stick with patched clothes against a wall. So they had it inherently in them. Okay, we now obviously live in a world where our ego has been let loose a little bit. So there is that within Tazkiyot nafs However, there's a lot of charlatans in that world, unfortunately. Because you see, when a person says that or claims he's a faqih, then you can understand if he's a faqih based on the answers he gives you. Because you think, okay, mashallah, this brother has some ilm. But when a person says he's a kamil, yani he's, he's kamil, yani he's ruh, has reached a high maqam. There's no way of assessing that, is there? You just have to take it, what he's saying. And he's not going to walk on water for you. Okay? He's not going to do like, you know, pull a coin from behind your ear. <laughs> he's not going to do tricks for you to prove he's Kamil. You just have to go by what people say that, but he, he looks like a buzurik. He sits in a masjid a lot. He does a lot of dhikr. There's no way of assessing it. Because there's no zahir to that. The only way you can see is like the ulama will say that that person who is close to and acts upon the sunnah in all circumstances, that is kamil. It's not like what the person claims or how long he sits in muraqaba or how much tahleels he does or tahmeels or tasbih. So yes, there is a place for tazkiyot the nafs. That's the point I'm making. But trying to find the right person and you know, that will be a little bit of a task because it is, it is challenging, uh, especially in present day and age, but it's very important that we are reflecting on that side. And this was again the talk that we had, which was the IQ, the EQ, and the SQ. We've also got to spiritually reach a high status as well. So I cannot necessarily, uh, maybe you can speak to Kali Saab afterwards, who can recommend uh, certain uh, ulama uh, that you can take. I'll leave that to his uh, good judgment. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What is the Islamic view on transgender? The schools and the media along with 9E Muslims. What's 9E Muslims? Okay, 9 comma E Muslims. What is that? Somebody just sent that message? Yeah. What does it mean, 9E Muslims? Yeah, ask the brother, what, unless it was a typo. Yeah, so anyway, whatever 9E Muslims are, who are, not aware, who are not aware want to change their gender. If obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet has forbidden, for example, for women to pluck their eyebrows, if he's forbidden to put a, a, a gap in your teeth, if he's forbidden to have tattoos placed on the skin, then what do you think the hukum is when a person wants to physically remove parts of their anatomy and become a completely different uh, gender. So I think the answer in that is pretty obvious. 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa At work, what is the best way to do wudu without putting your feet in the sink? Can we use disabled toilet rooms? No, I think you should uh, train to be uh, uh, an MMA fighter <laughs> or learn uh, Jeet Kune Do or, or Brazilian uh, Jiu Jitsu and then, you know, drop kick your foot into the water. <laughs> you know, why are you scared for, man? Uh, wear hoofs. Yeah, if you wear hoofs, then all you got to do is wipe on the hoofs is a, a problem solved. This is especially if you're going to a service station and you know, you go in there and you obviously you can get away with washing your face because you think, oh, a guy's been driving for four hours from London, he's going back to Bradford. I couldn't stand why he's putting water on his face. He's washing his arms, not sure why he's washing his arms for, I don't know. Then obviously you, you know, take your shoe off and a sock off and he's looking at you and then you know, <laughs> and you put your foot in the sink and he's thinking like, what the heck is this guy doing? Right, and then unfortunately because you know, Ramadan has been good. But we can't get close to the foot anymore. John, do me a favor. Do you mind washing my foot from where? And obviously, you've got to press the tap each time as well. So you're like, you're stuck now because the big dead's in the way and can't reach the tap. The foot's now, the thumb's stuck in the, uh, the big toe's stuck in the tap now. And you're like trying to dance around. And people are walking in now, filming it, putting it up on YouTube. So yeah, wear hoofs, saves, saves, all the, saves all the embarrassment. And then all you have to do is wipe on your hoofs, problem solved. And if you wear sandals as well, you don't even have to take your feet out from your hoofs because there's enough of the hoof that will get wiped. If you've got some slippers on, wipe over the top of it and it's done. You don't need to take them off and you can get away with it. That would be the best uh, solution. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I watch a lot of sport, football, Arsenal, Liverpool or cricket. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajim. <laughs> I don't even think I should answer that one. Are these football teams then? Arsenal and Liverpool, are they football teams? <laughs> are they like basketball teams or something like that? You know, whoever this person is, it obviously is a, a glory supporter, isn't it? Because Arsenal have not won anything for centuries, <laughs> right? Suddenly, you know, alhamdulillah, they're like top of the Premier League or something. Uh, everybody becomes an Arsenal supporter. Liverpool to Liverpool, cello. Or cricket. I get quite emotional when my team loses or anything wrong with that. Okay, don't get too, too emotional, but obviously if you have an affiliation to something, you have an affiliation to your country, you have an affiliation to your city, you have an affiliation to your ethnicity, you have an affiliation, it's natural because this is human nature. Okay, we're humans at the end of the day. So, you know, you get a little bit upset. But the thing is, if you're Arsenal Liverpool support, don't you get upset all the time? <laughs> or you'd be like emotionally distressed at this stage. You know, you have to support a real football team. What we're planning tonight. Okay, starting with some. Okay, that's the same question. With regards to the female relative marrying a Sikh, if the function is segregated, which it will be, as the women and men will be in two separate houses, should we still invite this couple to our house despite them being in a state of zina? We know, for example, that the Prophet al Islam would encourage the companions to maintain blood ties with their mushrik family members, even when a mushrika was coming to visit uh, one of the Sahabiyat, then again, the Prophet permitted her to do so. So we keep blood ties. We don't break blood ties. Now, obviously, you know, if the chap is not a blood tie, you can not invite him if you want and just invite the woman. That's a point you can make. So then you're not breaking a blood tie. Uh, but at the same time, you're making a position. Um, the thing is, you see, I don't know what the background is to this family, but clearly, you know, she, she's, she's not really understood kind of Islamic principles or, or whatever for her to be in this situation. But what we always do is that we, we try to give reactive fiqh, but we don't give proactive tarbiyah, and that's the problem is, you know, and then it just looks like the sharia is just bad news all the time. You can't do that. Okay, it's like, oh, you can't do that. It's like, oh, you can't do that. Yeah, everything we do, you're telling us you can't do that. Yeah, because you decided not to live by these principles. Now everything we're going to say is you can't do that. But if you live by these principles, say, oh yeah, you can do that. Oh, and you can do that, and you can do that. When you give free reign to your nafs to do as it wants, when it wants, then obviously Islam is trying to restrict that free reign to the nafs. It's trying to bring it under submission to Allah. That's what Islam is, to submit to Allah. So yes, there's going to be a lot of naysaying. But, you know, and then it just becomes difficult and awkward. Uh, and to be doing it in a, in a function, it's better to have that conversation. Go see that person and say, look, this is very difficult for us. The decision you have made, which you think is only impacting you, it doesn't impact on the whole family. 
How do you want us now to deal with this? Oh, you're going to have to accept me. But why? Why should we have to accept you? You know, why can't you also accept us? It's a two-way street. So there has to be a grown-up, mature conversation, not necessarily on Eid Day. You know, we have enough Royal Rumble in those old days. Remember Royal Rumble? You know, you have to enough Royal Rumble on Eid Day as it is to want to add an extra uh, thing to the, to the Eid, you know, parcel. You know, try to keep it civil. First time people get together, there's always going to be some person who's going to give an opinion and someone's going to disagree with that opinion. You know, say, oh, so when did you celebrate Eid then? Oh, I celebrate, oh, right, you know, that's it, mashallah. That's it, Eid discussion all evening now. Everyone's arguing, fighting, whatever. No one is even looking at the food. You try to make it civil, so you pass time, so at least, you know, that blood tie is there. Because you've got to understand what is the maqsad for us getting together. It's to maintain silat raham, is to maintain that blood tie. We just want to make sure that it's civil and it's respectful and whatever. We all choose our pathways. We all choose our life. You know, even in the hand, look at the fingers are so different. You could be born from the same mother, born from the same father, raised in the same house, but you choose different paths. And that's in houses, even in the houses of ulama. So it's not as though, you know, oh, we weren't religious enough. This is even in the houses of ulama. It's just the way it is. So all you're doing is trying to maintain some level of decorum and respect between the family. You can agree to disagree and take own pathways. But if a person has decided that Islam is not for them, you know, we don't know what the situation of this person is, they may have decided Islam is not for them. We don't know that. So it's those conversations that need to be had first, rather than try to fix, fix the problem. <laughs> During wudu, when you wash your feet, if you dry one foot with a towel before washing the other so that you don't spill water on the floor, does this nullify your wudu? No, it doesn't. Uh, one can do that. Is it allowed to support Manchester United as the club's nickname is the Red Devils? Some people say it's Makru Tahrimi or even Haram. <laughs> anyway, we'll ignore that question. Um, Assalamu alaikum. I'm asking on behalf of a dear sister. She has suffered from severe obsessive compulsive disorder for nearly 25 years, tried every dua, wazifa, NHS help possible. She's now trying to pray. Prior, she was not in the right state of mind, but is unable to, due to constantly repeating ghusl and wudu, and even after that, she cries, forgets, restarts until someone watches her. It is impossible for her to pray without someone watching and guiding her, but continues zikr now and is in her senses, but has con continuous confusion. She has other physical health issues too. Question, what is her accountability uh, with proof? What can she do? Please don't say pray like other muftis. Okay, there goes that, uh, there goes that answer out. I'm going to scrap that answer. Um, she, does, she knows that, but doesn't know how to. When her OCD is high, she screams and is out of control and can't control her thoughts and repetition. Her mental illness is at its highest. Uh, please do dua. Uh, da, 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 da. The question is meant to... Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I'm not going to say what the other muftis say, but all I will say is this. We are uh, uh, obliged to complete the acts which are being made compulsory upon us to our capacity. To our capacity, what I said earlier. Now, I've not seen the sister, so I cannot determine what her capacity is. Obviously, this sister who's written on her behalf has a good idea of what her capacity is. So she will determine from her capacity what is she's capable of doing. Obviously, if there's some issue with her tahara, then we've already given the ma'zur mas'ala, so she can look at that ma'zur mas'ala. If she doesn't have her senses, which seems to be suggesting, then obviously then the, the hukum of salah is not upon her. Okay, that has been lifted from her. So it's, you know, I c I'm only speaking from a distance just by those seven, eight, ten sentences. That sister will be in a better position. Maybe she can get an alima uh, to go with her to, you know, to help her in making that decision. Uh, but whatever her capacity is, whatever her capability is, she will do to the best of her ability. That is all she is accountable for. Salam, please make my email anonymous as I don't want the people to start attacking me for telling the truth. There are several questions I need to ask regarding the duties of a husband and a father. Are men these days still have to follow the Quran and Sunnah when it comes to provide for their family? And if they don't, then are they still considering themselves men or the member of the LGBTQ community? If a man provides for you on and off, when he's in good mood, he provides, and when he's angry, he doesn't but physically, mentally, and verbally abuse his family, including his kids and wife, do we still have to show respect to him? Uh, 
If a man is the head of the house, then why women have to pay for everything from her own money and basic stuff? If you are staying married to a man who has all the above qualities for the sake of your kids, are we still going to be married to him if we enter Jannah? If a man is angry, he can swear at your mother and calls names to your dead father. Can women have the same right? A man who prays in the front row and reads all his prayers on time is considered a pious man, even though he is hated by his family for mistreating them. Should a woman seek divorce from a man who commits zina of looking at other women while his wife is walking with him? Should a woman provide her husband with the paternity test when he says he doesn't believe that his kids are his when angry and who should pay for it? Are these the qualities of the men who are going to fight against the Dajjal? Are these men... Are these men are recognized as men or they feel like they are in the wrong bodies? I'm not calling them women because they can't going through that women go through. Quite heavy man. Please don't take it as a hate speech against men as I genuinely don't hate men, but people who are pretending to be men but doesn't want to fulfill their duties. My daughter is 16 and she's told me she is not going to marry anyone as all men are just cowards. So she rather stay with her friends and provide for herself. Please pay attention to our new generation and make them the true Muslims as the last generation have failed miserably. I have a son who also thinks that a man should provide for his family, but I don't know for how long he would think the same. The main reason for the email was to make them understand that being a man is a responsibility. And if you cannot handle the responsibilities, then don't get married or have kids. Because if you're relying on the government to provide for your family, then there's going to be so many broken families who are fed up with their husbands for not acting like a man. I will be listening to your answers, so please take time to answer a few questions. Okay, so obviously a very... Uh, a very uh, emotional and charged up question. Um, clearly she feels, uh, again, we can only go by the question. Uh, clearly she feels that um, her husband is not fulfilling his duties. So from an Islamic perspective, yes, a husband has to fulfill his duties. This is, this is why we say that we need a legal structure, we need a political structure for Muslims, right? But in the UK, where we are, this is by choice. We're not obliged, okay, to apply the Sharia in the UK. So what we're obliged in the UK is what the law says, the English law. That's what we're obliged. We're not obliged by UK law to pray five times a day. We choose to do that based on our own moral code. So obviously the way this woman has described this man, either he himself has anger issues or he's got some issues himself um he's abusive so it's it's obvious and i know the sister knows that that's why it sounds like she's just having a having a go because obviously she knows that this is not what a religious man should be doing we all know that and religiousness is not just measured by whether you're in the first stuff or not obviously taking care of your wife and taking care of your children is a responsibility in fact in a lecture a couple of sessions ago i made it quite clear that we should be worried about not necessarily the people we meet outside but we should be worried about those who are under our due care reason being is they're not going to speak up against us okay your friends and people outside will speak up against you you do something and tell you that was bang out of order you shouldn't have done that but your wife if she feels she can't speak she'll stay quiet the children, if they feel they can't speak, they'll just stay quiet. But they won't leave it at that on the Day of Judgment. They will collect. They will collect. So that's why, you know, we're not supposed to be, or when I say we're, men are not supposed to be dictators in their home. You know, sometimes when a man thinks, that, oh, I have authority, that doesn't make you a dictator. A weak man becomes a dictator. Kings in the time of the Prophet ﷺ were dictators. The people respected them and worked for them out of fear. But they plotted against them. They plotted against them. And whenever the opportunity rose, they killed them. So son would replace father. Whereas with the Prophet ﷺ, they were catching his saliva when he was spitting it on the floor. So did they respect the Prophet ﷺ out of fear? No. They respected the Prophet ﷺ out of love. So should our wives fear us or should they love us? And if a woman is only, you know, listening to us because we're going to get physical or we're aggressive or we raise our voice all the time, then what kind of life are we giving those women? For 25, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, all she does is despise and hate you. 
That's the only thought which is going through our mind. Same with the children. And they're just wishing that as soon as I hit 16, as soon as I hit 18, I am out. I don't want to see that guy ever again. And then fathers and sons are separate. And the father will still be stubborn in, in these circumstances. He still won't lower himself. Though. Yeah, even Bachai, this is my child. I used to hold this guy in my lap. If he ever held his child in his lap. You know, when the Prophet Islam used to kiss his children, when that companion mentions that I have X number of children, I think he said 10 or something. I've never kissed any of them ever. This is a rahmah, Allah, uh, the Prophet Islam says. Rahmah is something which Allah bestows upon whoever. You know, if people say, oh, my children shouldn't, you know, jump on me or they shouldn't, you know, they should respect me. The Prophet Islam would get on all fours and let his grandson ride him like a horse. Even when, I think it was Umama, the chai, uh, one of his daughter's daughter, granddaughter, she came to him crawling whilst he's giving khutbah. So he came down from the mimbar and he picked her up and he says, these are a fitna, they're, they're a trial. But his love was so much that he went and picked her up. Didn't ignore her, like, you know, kicked her away. That I'm giving her, you know, khutbah here. Because his love was there, his heart was soft. He had a soft heart. And that's why he was loved. That's why when, you know, he passed away, nobody could accept that he passed away because how are we supposed to live without the Prophet Islam? That love was gone. That constant care. At one point, you know, he nudged a companion with his staff. Afterwards, he apologized to him. He gave him the staff. He says, you nudge me. So he says, yes, I will ra raise, your, raise your garment. So he raised his garment. Instead of nudging him, he kissed his torso. He goes, I just wanted to kiss your torso. You know, what kind of man, when he mentions to the lady who sat crying at the grave, that be patient, and she says, that and me, you know, you know, go away, what do you know what I'm going through? When she goes, the first thing she comments, he had no guards. He had no guards. Why is the Prophet Islam going to have guards when everyone loves him? Why is he going to have guards? When Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab who was martyred, there were no guards. He was only martyred because there were no guards. He could turn his back on his companions and yet none of them would plot against him. Even when he moved, I think it, it was uh, Sayyidina Khalid ibn Walid was related to him through his mother. Even when he moved his maqam, his position, his status as a general, Sayyidina Khalid ibn had no gripes, no bad blood. Why? Because of the love. Because you know Sayyidina Umar Aliyah has love for him. And this is that's gone. And there has to be love and contentment in the house. You see, many young girls will reach out to complete strangers on social media. Many young girls will reach out to complete you know, strangers on social media. And that guy will say to all, oh, come meet me at this train station and we'll go and we'll elope together and all this bakwas. And he could be a guy like, like 30, 40 years older than her who's taking advantage of her. But what is she seeking? Love. She wants love. That's all our children seek. Why is it that our lads would prefer to be on the street? Because the boys give him love. The boys give him, they're his family. They will cover his back. They will look out for him. They won't walk away when he's in a fight. They will stand toe to toe and protect him. So why is it that our children then are seeking love from outside of our homes? And then we say, oh, our society is broken. Kids are off it. It's this country. Well, you decided to come to this country. And nobody put a chain on a ball attached to your ankle that you can't leave this country. What if it was down to you, brother? What was down to you? The fact that you were made Amir of this house and this house has failed because you're the Amir. Could that not be the reason? You're quick to blame them. Even though you are the Amir of the house. And even if people don't listen, cajole, love, come back, you know, people live in constraint times. Shouting, screaming, getting physical doesn't work. Okay? It doesn't work. 
it doesn't work. So I hope I've given a significant um, time to this question. Uh, it is obviously an issue. This is not an isolated issue. That's the reason why I gave it significant time. I do get questions like this quite a lot. Um, so it's important that it's addressed. Uh, and it's important that we as men take that responsibility because like I said, on Yom al Qiyamah, you can pile as many salahs as you want. You can pile as many fasts as you want. You can pile as many uh, zakat as you want. But if you've done any justice against your wife, if you've done any justice against your children, it's all gonna go. It's all gonna go. So when you go home and you buy that rose for your wife that you've always said you're gonna buy, but bought it last minute because it was three pound fifty. <laughs> or some hadiyah, then sisters, if you're listening, you make dua for me. Because they're only doing it because I told them. <laughs> they ain't doing it properly. Yeah, they're supposed to be loving the house. Husband and wife should be looking at each other with love, with care. The children should see and say, SubhanAllah, look at mom and dad. <laughs> yeah, they, they're still looking into each other's eyes. So they want to get married. Have you noticed that you have arranged marriage and what's the other one called? Love marriage. What's the opposite of love? Hate. hate marriage. So arranged marriage must be hate marriage. See the terminology. One is zina and it's called love marriage. <laughs> so beautiful, isn't it? I always use such a nice word. So one is zina and it's called love marriage. One is arranged which is done according to sharia and it's called the opposite of love which is hate. So if we can demonstrate to our children that there's love in this marriage, there's fun in this marriage. There's musty in this marriage. There's candles. <laughs> Rose petals. When they see all of that, then they'll say, you know, I want to I wanna get married. Because it's beautiful looking at mom and dad, you know, they're like 50 or 60 or 70. And look at the love that they have for each other. Not that they don't even want to look at each other and he just commands as soon as he comes in, <laughs> roti. <laughs> I've been sat here for... 33 seconds, 34, 35, and still no food on the table. And that poor woman's been running around all day with the kids and whatever, and now she's trying to you know, serve the master that's arrived. Again, look in the life of the Prophet He would stitch his own clothes, he would milk his own goat, he would go shopping himself. He never asked anything from anybody. People did his khidmah, don't get me wrong. Any opportunity they would do his khidmah. But he would not ask from them. So this is what we've got to try to do as men. If we are men, as the sisters are challenging us. Is to be real men. And a real man. Is a nice, cuddly pussycat at home. <laughs> and he's a lion outside. Yeah, he's a lion outside. Okay. Because he shows love and tenderness. The Sharia is there. He makes sure that that is stipulated and the rules and regulations are there so it's understood that we make mashwara. That's the other thing as well. Very rarely do we make mashwara in the house. The man just makes unilateral decisions. That's not how the Sharia is supposed to be. What the man is supposed to do is hear everybody's views. Even his Balik children, even his non Balik children. We're thinking of going to uh, uh, Pakistan. We're thinking of going to India. We're thinking of doing this. What do you think? Dad, this, that, the other. Okay, what do you think? Dad is like, what do you think? What do you think? He hears everybody much. Now he gives Joab back to their mashwara. Yeah, I know you're saying you don't want to go because it's too hot, but we're going to go around April time where it's not too hot. What do you think? Yeah, actually, yeah. So he gets purchase. He gets purchase. Everybody's on board now with this idea. Not afterwards when they're going to say, oh no, he never listens to us. You know, I don't even go to India. Why is he turning this to India for? I probably he's going to get you married. That's why we're going there for. You know? <laughs> When they do, you know, instead if they had that open conversation, there'd be no little secret party meetings in, in other rooms, text message, you know, I know we have the fam group, but then the kids have got their own. <laughs> so they go in the kids group meeting, where? Sister's room, what time? 10 minutes. No parents, exclamation mark. So then they have their own little private conversation in there. So they're now you're going, you're getting firqa. Where's the unity? Where's the unity gone? We want to unify the ummah. Allahu Akbar kabira. But unify your own house first. Once you unify your own house, then unify your street, then unify your city, then unify your country. Aista, Aista. And then, inshallah, we'll give you the title of Amir al Mu'minin and we'll sit you on the chair in Masjid Nabwi and we say, we're ready. Where are you sending us, brother? So let's get real.
Uh, let's get real, let's understand the reality. What we have authority over, we try to make a change. May Allah subhanahu wa give us strength. Assalamu alaikum. Can we buy government bonds of UK? No. Can we buy bonds of Pakistan? I've not looked into the bonds of Pakistan, but I'm pretty sure there's also interest bearing in that area as well. I know that the Pakistan is not free from interest, which is why I said, even though it's referred to as the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, there are still many laws in Pakistan that are not Islamic. Um, all we see is, you know, our brothers in uh, Afghanistan that are trying their very best to establish some level of Sharia. So, you know, that's all that exists. Are you understanding any more? Let me see if Balba sent anything else. Yeah, I, uh, sorry, let me just get that one, then I can give it back to you, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so women can pray behind the men at the masjid. Did I say that? Um, but should there be a barrier between them at the masjid, and what are the rules or requirements? And was there a barrier in the masjid at the time of the Prophet, alayhi So we do get these kind of questions that, what was the situation in the time of the Prophet, alayhi And they're interesting questions. I understand why people give those, because what they're saying is that, you know, we should be connecting with the time of the Prophet, and absolutely we should. But bear this in mind as well, that dogs used to wander in and out of Masjid Nabwi. Okay, bear this in mind that people used to wear shoes in Masjid Nabwi. They didn't remove the shoes all the time. In fact, the Prophet Islam has actually encouraged people to keep their shoes on because he says that the Jewish community remove their shoes when they pray, we should pray with our shoes on. Obviously, when there's no Najasat, then in a Salah, what he does is that he takes his shoes off, so all the Sahaba take their shoes off. So he said, Jibreel Islam came to tell me that there's some Najasat on my shoe, why did you take yours off for? The imams were. So therefore, the, the masjid was completely different. Completely different. Society was completely different. It was mentioned, for example, that the worst suf for the men is the suf at the end, and the worst suf for women is the first suf. Because the men at the back can look between their legs at the women behind, and the women in the first suf are having little sneaky peeks at the men in the front. We find that not so long after the Prophet Islam passed, they were now ruling that we should stop ladies coming to the masjid because there was a fitna rising. And the answer that was given was that if the Prophet Islam was alive now, he would do the same. So people say, yeah, but what about the time of the Prophet Islam? Yeah, but in the time of the Prophet Islam, the Quran wasn't put together as a book. In the time of the Prophet Islam, we didn't do jama'ah of uh, taraweeh. So we follow the sunnah of the Prophet Islam and the sunnah of Khulafa Rashidin. Notice how their, I won't say innovations, but you know, how their new acts are called sunnah. They're not called bid'ah. They're called sunnah. So we cannot say the Quran being put together is a bid'ah because they were done within the time of the golden period. So therefore, I know there's a, this, this conversation I've heard in several quarters about you know, ladies coming to the masjid. Um, I would say this with regards to that is there should be facilities available in masjids for women. There should be. Okay? Should we encourage women to come? That's a different matter. That's a different matter because from our school's position, the best place for a woman to pray is in a home. But should there be facilities? And the reason why I say there should be facilities is because years ago, um, I'm not really good as a shopper. You know, I'm, I, you know, my poor wife. She just leaves me at home. Um, so I'm not really good. I don't even do my own shopping. My kids do my shopping. Alhamdulillah, Allah bless them. So I don't like shopping. It just, I get sort of like psychologically, my brain little thing goes off, little thing pops. I can't wait in queues. Like I think, why am I waiting in a queue for? You know, so I just can't deal with that. So I have to just stay at home and the family realize that, okay, he's, he's, he's not well. Just send him back to the car. So they just say, oh, you gonna go back to the car, dad? So yeah, 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 of course, should we talk? Yeah, take me to the car. Well, put me in the car and they just put a book in my hand. Everything is normal again. <laughs> All right. Uh, I can't survive. So they know that. And obviously, poor wife tried for nearly 20 odd years. She's given up, mashallah. Allah bless her. So now I don't go. So, but we did that time. We're going to Birmingham. My wife doesn't like driving on motorways. So I said, you know, I'll do it, mashallah like a soldier that I was, drove down to Birmingham. Obviously, they, you know, when women shop, mashallah, they shop. So obviously, you know, and obviously it was for my daughter's wedding, so I, I let them off as well a little bit. Normally I'd be, oh, you know, we've done 86 hours of shopping, can we go back to Bradford? Um, so they were going, you know, let's go here, let's go there, let's go there. And obviously Salah times are coming in. Zuhur came in, Asir came in. Now I'm okay. I just walked into our masjids and I prayed. I asked, oh, is there a place for sisters to pray? No. 
So I had to go back to the wife. I said, um, you can't pray Salah. So she goes, what do I do? Should I pray in the car? I says, you can't pray in a car. She goes, should I pray on the street? I said, oh, you can't pray on the street. So she said, I not pray. I said, no, no, you have to pray. Hmm. Bit of a problem, isn't it now? So it's all right when you're in Wolfram store and you live near Wolfram store. That's all right. But let's just say I'd come from Bradford and I was here and I've got no family here and I'm just doing some whatever and my wife's with me. Where, where does she pray? Do I go find a shopping mall? Because there's going to be a prayer facility for her to go pray there. Do I go back onto the M1 and keep driving until the first service station comes and ask her to pray there? Where do I take her? I'm just asking you a genuine question. Where do I take her? So there were some masjids, okay, of another inclination that facilitated women. So I had to take her there. Obviously she prayed a salah there, mashallah, a nice, comfortable place, prayed and, and she came out. Her father's was done. She felt good. I felt good. And I said, okay, what are we going to have to eat? So yes, there should be facilities. That's, that's, that's key. Okay, women go out shopping now, women go here, women go there, they're out of the house. So it may not be that they make it back in time for Salah time. So the facility should be there. Should we be encouraging? I think that's something we should not look at encouraging because we look at it from, it's a ritual act of worship. Where is the best place for a woman to perform her ritual act of worship? According to the Ahnaf, the best place for a woman to perform a ritual act of worship is in a home. That's a, a ritual perspective. It's nothing to do with anything else. It's not that, oh yeah, but women are going to restaurants and women are going shopping, women are going here, women are going there. Why are you stopping off the masjid? We're not. We're saying, are you asking from a religious perspective, what is the best place for her to pray? Then this is the best place for her to pray. That's all we're saying. Okay, that's what we're saying. So that needs to be, needs to be understood. Was it, well, there was another question or something, wasn't it? Was that? Um, on the salah, on the, no, on the, women praying or the manner in which we're praying so then obviously we can't have you know same selfs in the same vicinity now um you know we tell sisters don't apply too much perfume they will apply too much perfume okay women don't like smelling men don't care <laughs> you know we've got a nice sweaty pong coming off us mentioning no names where are the lads yeah we don't care this is this is man smell all right, but obviously women don't like any little bit of bad smell coming, so there's going to be perfume. So a person is praying salah, he's smelling. What did the Prophet ﷺ describe? He said, this is zina of the nose. Yeah, he said, this is zina of the nose. There's zina of the eyes, there's zina of the nose, there's zina of the ears. Then the private part either confirms it or denies it. But the attraction comes through the senses. The attraction doesn't come from the tool. The tool is just finishing the deal yeah the attraction is coming through the smell the look the sound so if high heels clippity clip or you know anklets whatever all these sorts of things are triggered that they're not in the market for making them for no reason you know they are there to serve to attract men that's what they're there for so therefore we have these issues that we face so it's got to be a separate area separate entrances but then obviously nowadays you know every masjid has cctv so who has access to that cctv are men watching that CCTV. So when there's women praying, going into sajda, going into ruku, there's men watching that CCTV. So now you've opened another can of worms. So how do you police that? So there's so many issues, so the, uh, people need to, you know, we always do these risk assessments, don't we? Before you do any work, you're supposed to do a risk assessment. Before you take kids on a trip, you do a risk assessment. Before you do anything, it's gotta be a risk assessment. So there has to be some kind of shari'i risk assessment, that what are the risks associated with this? What are the gains associated with this? And logically put it through. And can you find ways and manner to circumvent those? We know masjid not too far from here. The issues that it faced because of, uh, you know, allowing certain doors to open. So. That's my kind of general answer in that regard, inshallah. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Mufti Amjid. Uh, is it okay? Is going to the gym okay when it's used by both men and women? Can you take supplements like steroids and pre protein as they can change your body? So clearly, this brother has seen, mashallah, my figure. <laughs> <laughs> so he's uh, admiring the shoulders, the back. Uh, sometimes they call me silverback um, and he's admiring the pecs and he's admiring the, the guns is it guns yeah so he's thinking surely this brother's going to the gym and mashallah he's also saying that he must be on steroids or something because you don't get like that naturally Alhamdulillah, does, that doesn't just come down due to hard work uh, so when it comes to the gym obviously for men we are permitted to go outside we are not the ones who are supposed to stay in our homes 
okay? So men are permitted to go outside. We should go to those gyms that obviously aren't usually frequented um, by, by females. It's called the raw gyms, the bro gyms. I'm sure you've been to those kind of gyms, okay? Where it's just smell of man smell, sweat everywhere, lots of noise, lots of screaming, lots of Ugh! lots of looking in the mirror. Okay, and you know, women tend not to go to those kind of gyms. So if you go to those kind of gyms, you're all right. But there will be times where if you go to a more mainstream type of gym, that you may get some women there. But generally speaking, it tends to be low numbers. It obviously depends where you are. Uh, so you would try to, you know, we are told as men to lower the gaze. So obviously lower the gaze, look in a way, move to somewhere else. So that's our answer to give to that. Can you use supplements? Yes, obviously you can use natural supplements. Uh, should you use supplements like steroids and all the rest of it? I think, uh, you know, there's that human uh, growth hormone, uh, there's anabolic, anabolic steroids, there's all these sorts of things that you can take, or as, as it's referred to in the game as juice. Okay, you can take all these sorts of things. Best thing to do, I just know about you, see, because I go to the gym. So best to avoid uh, all of these kind of things. What is a natural supplement? Bismillah, take it, you know, protein. Uh, if you need to get your protein up, if you need to do this, casein, all the rest of it, there's nothing wrong in that. But anything which is anabol anabolic, anything of that, you know, that's something that needs to be avoid avoided. Um, and, and just get down to some hard work, inshallah. Ashi in the front of the why did Muslims divide? Why did Muslims divide into different sects? Because we all like our own opinion. That's why. Plus the Prophet has some predicted that this Ummah will split into 72, or is it 73? 73 sects. Yeah? The Jew, the, yeah, 73 sects. All will go to Jahannam, except one. And who are those? Ahle Sunnah wal Jama'a. Okay? So it's, it's the norm. It's been predicted. The death of Usman was predicted. The Shahada of Usman was predicted. The fitna that would come after was predicted. All these things. That's why we shouldn't panic. Because we had a man in the, in, in, in the Prophet who was telling us the things that are going to happen. So we as a community should be more ready for it. Not in a state of shock, but more prepared for it. That's why we have a Prophet. Because a Prophet tells us what's going to happen in the future. Apart with that ilm that Allah SWT shared with him. And therefore, we, we go in that way. We discussed the uh, Shia question upstairs. It's a broad spectrum. It's simple to say that those people who believe in Allah, those people who believe in the book as a revealed text, those people who don't disregard, uh, who say that the book hasn't been tampered with, those people who don't uh, consider um, uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar to be non-Muslim, those people who don't consider them to be Farsiq, once that whole, you know, it, that's the category. If you're not in that group, whatever you claim you are, whatever, you know, however you want to self-identify, because nowadays it's all about self-identification, then that person is considered as a Muslim. So I think we're close to one last question out now. What was it now? One three twenty. Nearly two hours, mashallah. Need to sleep. Asalaamu alaikum Hazrat. Lovely to meet you yesterday before Tarawih. I can't attend today's session. In the QA today after Zohar, could please explain how to pay past years of zakat on a pension? I just discovered that my father had one for around fifteen years. I have paid the last seven years of it. Do I carry on paying all the previous missed years? I've paid around six and a half grand in zakat for the seven years. So another eight grand left to pay. It's matured over time and it's worth less before. Yes, you, you know, you're not required to give the zakat. The zakat requirement is obviously your father. I don't think you, did he say his father's passed? Okay, you've not said that if your father's passed away. So it's your father's responsibility uh, to clear his zakat. As we were mentioning upstairs about Isal al Thawab and also about giving fidya for somebody who's already died, we know that every act of worship requires a near. Every act of worship requires a near. So if we find, for example, that our mother or father did not pray salah or they did not give their zakat or they did not fast, then what we try to do as a good son or good daughter is to give fidya after they've passed away. But some will say, because that person hasn't made the near, how should, why should they get reward for it? So that's why we always add the mashiat of Allah. We say, inshallah. Okay? Because we don't know. Because that, our father or mother, whoever it was, chose not to pray. When they had capacity to pray, they chose not to pray. Now we're trying to fix it after the event. Is Allah going to accept that? When that person, whilst alive, chose not to pray? Similarly, that person, whilst alive, chose not to fast? And we're now trying to fix it after the event? Will Allah accept that? So that's all we can say is inshallah. Okay, because that person made a stance. 
we all get that chance to make a stance of whether we're going to pray once we're alive or not. And that's the stance that we have made and we try to obviously speak to our parents and loved ones to try to get them on board as well so that they don't have to face these difficulties. I think that's the job lot. Let me have one last look on the... Uh, yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Oh, mashallah, guys, I'll be too late. So on this topic of moon sighting, right? Or moon shining. Um, where do you start? Kind of worms time. So basically, at, you know, firstly, let's look at it this way. At the moment, what happens, if we look at, say, for example, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, people don't necessarily wait for any moon sighting committee to make a declaration. They just go onto Twitter or go onto social media or go onto uh, uh, some Sky Network and see that people are praying Taraweeh and they make that declaration themselves at three, four o'clock in the afternoon. And then they kind of apply a little bit of pressure on the masjid and then the masjid decides that, oh, it's gonna be uh, Eid tomorrow. Because unfortunately what we're saying, if you look, we're here for the Juma Bayan, the democratization of fiqh is no longer the ulama telling the people, it is the people now saying it must be Eid tomorrow because you know, it's Eid in Saudi. Uh, why isn't it Eid tomorrow? You know, Saudi's got Eid tomorrow. What's wrong with you guys? You guys, you know, stupid or something. They didn't even watch the news. Uh, you're not following this, whatever. So that's what's changed. So this is, a, this is a problem. So that's one thing. So really what each masjid should be doing is each masjid should be going to a moon sighting committee, okay? Looking at what their criteria is. The criteria is that you, we should be going by our own local sighting. That's the criteria. Pakistan, is closer to Saudi Arabia than we are to Saudi Arabia. Pakistan is about two and a half thousand kilometers away. We are about four and a half thousand kilometers away. Pakistan don't take Saudi sign. They go by their own sighting. India doesn't take Saudi sign. They go by their own sighting. So why are we four and a half thousand miles on this side of the planet doing it? It's a question to ask. Obviously, I'm not going to go into the history. I'm sure you've heard the history several times as to how we arrived here. Okay, but we are here now. So we should be going by UK sighting and trying to find the Hilal. If we don't find the Hilal, then we have one option, is we just go and count to 30 and say, Chalo, it's 30, count to 30, count to 30. However, we aren't fully confident in the system. Therefore, we need to determine that that Hilal which was not cited, was that not cited because of unnatural excessive cloud cover because we're an island? or genuinely, it could not be cited. So we go to the nearest Muslim country, which is Morocco, and see, did, do they cite it? This is to determine that is our citing valid? If they declare it, then we are content with their declaration and we will declare that citing as well. That is the sound approach after years of studying this topic. I've studied this for over a decade. I've written on it extensively. I've done videos on it extensively. Alhamdulillah, I'm fortunate in that I have a scientific background. Alhamdulillah, I'm fortunate, and I know a few fiqh kitabs as well. Alhamdulillah, I'm fortunate in that I've been through an academic process as well. So I did, using all those, that knowledge that I've gathered over the years, that's the correct position to adopt. The aim should be that we should move to a local sighting and, and only a local sighting eventually. Well, in order to do that, in order to do that, we need all parties on board. We need all parties on board. So that will happen. So for now, the sound position to adopt is we're, in, we're Muslims in the UK, so we go by UK, because that's where we are, surprisingly. We go by UK, and in the absence of that, we go. But in reality, we, as in Joe Public, are just going by the Moon Sighting Committee. We don't have expertise. Like we don't say, oh, you know what, 15 degrees, I like the number 15, but I don't like the number 18. So I'm gonna go with 15 degrees. You can't do that, you've got, you've got no expertise to be making that kind of decision. You leave it to the ulama who are making the timetables, who have got expertise in timekeeping, who have got expertise in uh, um, research in that area. No, we don't take hands, uh, questions from the floor in that manner, sir. Write it on a piece of paper. So in that regard, that is the best position to adopt. And that, mashallah, is a position I hear that this great masjid adopts. Alhamdulillah. So keep up the good work. 
Yes, there's going to be a little bit of difficulty. Yes, there's going to be a little bit of uh, resistance. Yes, there's going to be a little bit of, oh, what's going on, whatever, you know, this, that, and the other. But we just got to stand firm. The tide will turn. Things will move in the right direction. At least you can then say, alhamdulillah, you know, many of the companions used to say, not that I'm saying it's the same thing, but I like this example. Many of the companions used to say, oh, we wish that we had accepted Islam in the early days rather than accepting Islam in the later days. At least, alhamdulillah, you are from the uh, leaders in that you adopted this position, not due to the majority, but because you found it to be correct. And that's the way, that's the way to do it. And yet, as I said, there's going to be challenges, uh, but those challenges can be, can be dealt with. And, and keep going, alhamdulillah, it's the right way to do it. As I said, we, I can sit here and pick holes in the reason why we as a committee or the committee that I'm part of don't accept uh, Saudi sightings, the evidence is out there, it's easy to see, I've written a 70, 60 page, 80 page detailed document on it, read it, I'm not going to regurgitate it here, uh, there's enough evidence. Uh, I uh, adopted the moon sighting committee that uh, followed the Saudi sightings all my life. Uh, my family still do to this day, my family is in my parents and siblings, um, but when the truth is in your face, then the truth is in your face, how can you deny it? So I hope that's covered the uh, more exciting issue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. It's, uh, it's, uh, you'll find it, so the question is, how is Fidya calculated per Salah? Is it fixed amount per Salah? It is, yes. If you go to Wifakul Ulama's website, Wifakul Ulama's website is a fantastic website, if I don't mind saying myself. <laughs> Uh, and if you go there, and there's a, uh, I think it's under Sadaqatul Fitr or something like that. But if you go there, you'll find it. And there's a detailed uh, researched article there, mashallah, and the details will be in there. Uh, the quantity, I think, is four pound uh, that we have fixed. And that is, uh, and that is it. Did I answer this question? Yeah, I did answer this. Wahru, that one. Oh, hold on. Um, Jazak khairan for answering Hazrat. Father is still alive, alhamdulillah. I'm just assisting him to pay from his funds and he's willing and happy to pay, alhamdulillah. See, that's fantastic that his father is still alive and the opportunity to fulfill that before he, he passes. As he is of old age, he requires assistance in all daily, his daily matters. My question was more around the calculation. Am I doing this correctly? I'm basing some of this on calculation, on sound guesswork, I may add, as a lot of facts I don't have. Yeah, in the absence of yaqeen, in the absence of facts, then we go with ghalib al-dhan. That's the only alternative that we have. Ghalib al-dhan is your most predominant position. Once you've done your research and think this is going to be most accurate, and then you slightly err on the side of caution, and that's the position you give. Why don't the other ulama follow what you have just covered regarding moon sighting? That's a bit of a difficult question for me to answer because I guess you would have to ask the uh, other ulama. Yes, the, this question is coming up. Why are they? Uh, it's not appropriate in a non-scholarly forum to speak of ulama. Obviously, however, whatever differences there are between the ulama, that's the difference between the ulama. So we should have a, a level of respect and decorum when we speak of them. Uh, it is unfortunate, um, but uh, sometimes when positions have been ingrained and heels have been dug in, it, it just takes that a little bit longer. So inshallah, with your du'as and with the effort that's made, slowly but surely, um, there will be some, uh, some movement over the coming you know, weeks, months and, and years. But we know now, sometimes with these things, it's a generational change. A lot of our youngsters are far more uh, aware of you know, the concept of moon sighting, the Salah times. They're not just gonna go see a Salah timetable and just blindly accept it. That those days are gone, okay? They're, they're gonna wanna know what's the basis of this? What's the basis of that? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? So those people who just rely on blind obedience, they're gonna lose their congregations. And those who don't rely on blind obedience will actually give the leel and give a position as to why they're saying that, they will get a following. So, inshallah, haq will prevail. Oh, sorry, as-sawab will prevail, rather than haq will prevail, amen. One just last thing and then we're good. Yes, alhamdulillah, wa akhiru that one, and alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah? I know, don't don't take care, mashallah. <laughs> Where's this gone? Is this to under the table? Take me. Twenty two. Ah.